30th, 2012. Will the clerk please call the roll? Board Member Murphy? Here. Board Member Gasparino? Here. Board Member Stubblefield? Here. Board Member Herlock? Here. Will the clerk please administer the oath to those who are going to be providing testimony tonight? Please raise your right hand. You and each of you do solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give in the matters now pending before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask the, uh, the petitioner to introduce yourself and, uh, and present your petition argument to the, uh, to the board. All right, my name is uh, Matt Larvey. I'm uh, the general manager of uh, my family business, which is uh, Gene Larvey Guitars in Oxnard. Uh, we are a manufacturer of uh, high-end and, in some cases, vintage accurate instruments, uh, musical instruments. We make uh, acoustic guitars, electric guitars, and uh, mandolins. Uh, my family's been in business 45 years, uh, and we manufacture many thousand guitars a year. Um, the, the basis, uh, the, there's two issues at uh, stake for us, uh, which are apparent in two rule violations, which we discovered accidentally. Could you, uh, could you excuse me just one minute? I, I failed to, uh, to get your, your petition information on the record. I'll do that first and then you can continue. Uh, sure. What, what yeah, tonight, tonight the board is going to be hearing petition number 843, which is a petition of Gene Larravee Guitars USA, Inc. for regular variance from District Rule 29.C, conditions on permits, violation of permit to operate 04723, condition 9, and Rule 74.30.B.5, wood products coatings requirements. Thank you. You may continue. Uh, so basically the, there's two issues for us which we discovered accidentally. Uh, we've always been in good standing with the Air Pollution Control District uh, and uh, about a year ago we uh, one of the products we've been using since our inception uh, was no longer available and at the end of our uh, annual inspection with Jay uh, I asked him, I said, hey, naphtha is becoming difficult to get and uh, we, can, we can't get it anymore. Do you have any suggestions for alternatives? You know, we're looking for, for what we can use. And uh, it became apparent immediately that we're not supposed to use it. Uh, and it turns out that there's two reasons um, th that are uh, the cause, one of the, which is that uh, our, our uh, permit only allows what is called a dry method or water-only uh, surface preparation. This was one area of our permit, honestly, we looked at, and if, if we were never reading the permit looking for that specifically, nobody in our industry is able to do a dry method or water only uh, pre surface preparation. Uh, the, the acoustic guitar and any instrument that we finish has to be degreased between layers of finish. Uh, this is an absolute must or the finish does not adhere. Uh, the finished layers are extremely thin, um, often just one or two quick coats. Uh, so that, that's the first primary issue. The, the second issue is that even if we were allowed to use any uh, kind of degreaser, we're only allowed to use up to, uh, I believe it's 20 grams per liter of VOC in the, in the degreaser. This is problematic as we have not been successful in finding a good alternative. We use a very small amount and uh, it never came up on our radar because it's, it, we never considered that it was a, a regulated product until it was too late. Uh, usually we would just go to the hardware store, buy a little pint of it and that would last a month or two and that was that until it became uh, apparent that it wasn't. Um, so that's, that's the basis. There's two, two issues that we face. Uh, we've tried uh, several different uh, alternatives. The first one we started working with was the unregulated acetone. Uh, you know, that's what most everybody in our industry has to, you know, that's the one cleaner that everybody can use because it's unregulated. 
Uh, unfortunately, with the finishes that we use, we can't use acetone as it dissolves the finish. Uh, and so I brought a sample of one of the parts. Uh, I can pass it around if you want to see it at any point, uh, which shows the damage that it does. Uh, I also brought uh, an example of one of our finished guitars so you can see the quality that we are going after. Uh, for us, what we're up against as a company is we face uh, huge competition from uh, other manufacturers in other states, uh, particularly states like Pennsylvania, uh, Texas, uh, and also other countries, uh, the big one being China these days. And we face a lot of competition from those countries where there are no restrictions as to what can be used. And so our customers have the expectation that our instrument is going to look like those guitars. Uh, and, you know, what, what we are hoping to accomplish is not, you know, we don't want, like, carte blanche or anything like that. We just want to be able to operate. We want to be able to clean our guitar and finish it appropriately. You know, we, like I said, we've been in good standing for a long time. Uh, we use low VOC finishes. Uh, and, uh, you know, everything else falls within our permit with the exception of about 10, 10 to 20 gallons of petroleum distillate we use for cleaning. Uh, so if you want to see any of this stuff, I'll be glad to pass it around to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, n normally at this point, um, we open up the, uh, uh, the hearing to questions of board members um, to the petitioner. Uh, Mr. Murphy has indicated that he would like to ask a, a rules-related question to the district before we begin that. My question is, when I'm reading 7430 and I'm looking at 7430C2, which reads sections B1, B2, B3, B4, and B5 of this rule, shall not apply to any stationary source that emits less than 200 pounds of ROC in a, every rolling period of 12 consecutive calendar months from wood products coating operations. Why is this under that exemption? Why is why do we have a violation of 7430B5A if it says uh, B5, Section B5 is exempt from the rule. Their, their permit allows them over four tons worth of emissions per year. Their, their total emissions from all of their wood products coating are well above 200 pounds a year. Uh, that, that's well above 200 pounds per year. That, that 200 pounds a year is for like, a, uh, like if you had a very small cabinet shop or something. Is, is, your, is your mic on, Mr. Uh, Susie? How's that? Is that better? That, that's better. Sorry. Um, their total emissions from their wood products coating is well above 200 pounds a year, so they're not exempt from those sections. That's 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 basically it's it's a it's a kind of a low use exemption. Most of our coating rules have have a pretty similar section in them. Okay. In in, in what we were presented, the only total figure that we had was um, uh, it says on page three or four of the um, uh, the report given by the district Larrabee uses 20, 10 to 20 years of petroleum distillate solvents with ROC emissions of approximately 114 pounds that seems to contradict what you just said. Um, uh, well, I, I think uh, that when that was written, that they were they were just they were just referring to the naphtha and not and not to the coatings or or any other cleanup solvents or or anything else. It, maybe that should be clarified. Okay. And does does the uh, petitioner that your, agree that you use uh, over? Is that your satisfy yes, your yes. question? Does. Um, I'd like to open it up now to uh, um, questions of board members and they have for the district. Mr. Larivay, is yes. that correct? Do I have that right? Okay. Did you say that you use a pint 
of NAPTHA every month or two? It's, uh, I don't have an exact amount because we've never had to track it. I can know that, I can count the number of times on, on both hands that I drive to the hardware store a year to buy a, a pint or two of NAPTHA. It's, it, you know, <clears throat> it's like when you're painting your house, you know, you, oh, I need to go get some NAPTHA. I go buy a little can of it. Right, so it's it's not like I phone an industrial chemical company and uh, and buy large quantities of it. Uh, and to answer uh, your question, I think our to Chris could probably comment on it, but I think our total tonnage is less than one ton a year, or right around one ton, uh, and that includes all our low VOC coatings, urethanes, polyesters, and <clears throat> and that as well. Thank you. Um, other other questions. Mr. Yes, yes um, I have a, a lot of questions, but the first thing that, that, that I'd like to ask is I was given a bunch of MSDS sheets and yet you not addressed what you want us to really look at with regards to these. I see some handwritten notes on here um, and I would appreciate it if you would address uh, the hearing board as to purpose of this and maybe what you have and have not done relative to testing, using, or finding out from others in the industry uh, as to whether or not these really work. Thank you. Absolutely. Before we, before we respond to that, um, we, for the record, the, uh, the petitioner has, has provided uh, to the clerk and who's provided us five sheets, all of which are material safety data sheets. Uh, do you wish for these sheets to go into evidence for tonight? I, I, don't, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, if you want to, by all means, go ahead. They're more just to illustrate what I'm about to talk about. I, I think if, it, if it's going to be part of the testimony, the, the sheets probably should go into evidence. Okay. Do you, do you have, a, have them? Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So basically uh, where we started, once we... Uh, knew that NAPTHA was becoming unavailable. You know, I, I talked first, I talked to Jay and, uh, you know, I started looking around. We deal with a, a couple of different paint suppliers. The, the primary one we deal with is a very large one called TCP Global. Uh, they're a Southern California retailer and we buy pretty much all of our finishes from them, at least 75%. And so they sent us several different uh, alternatives for NAPTHA. Uh, and we said, look, you know, they need to be California compliant and so forth. Um, the big one they sent us uh, first was uh, a product, it, it's the MSDS labeled SEM at the top. And they sent us this one uh, right away. Uh, it worked like a charm. It, the thing, it was a great product. We didn't know a lot about it. We had the MSDS, it printed it off, put it in our booklet and, and really didn't think about it. Looking at it, you know, when we started having to look at it, it turns out, uh, and it's all on the other pages, unfortunately, it turns out that it's all NAPTA based as well. So it's just NAPTA in a different form. Uh, so we went back to them and said, look, we, we need to find some low VOC solutions. So they sent us a variety of products, all of which turn out to be mid to high VOC with the exception of one, uh, which works, uh, which it says in the upper, uh, right hand corner, sorry, uh, left hand corner, 271. You'll see that on the page there. It's for a product called AeroPrep. And where this, this is a great product, it works fairly well in some of the departments for us. And right on their website, it says that it's uh, South Coast exempt, which is what VCAPCD uses as its guideline to set the, uh, the, uh, regulation. But if you look at it, it's exactly the same as the other products. The, it's, the primary ingredient is VMNP naphtha and the, the uh, total VOC is 673. So how is this exempt? And the, you know, we, we get really confused at it. Like this is exempt, but because it's in an aerosol can and the others are not exempt. Uh, so we've continued to look at other uh, alternatives too. And uh, someone, I can't remember his name off the top of our head, uh, at uh, VCAPCD gave us this list, which unfortunately I don't have a copy of, uh, but I can pass it out if you want to see it, uh, which is all of, uh, from South Coast, 
the different uh, cleaners that are VOC exempt. And I've basically gone through and highlighted in green, we've, we contacted virtually every company or looked up all the products and everyone in green is not applicable for the, the application that we use. Out of the whole sheet there's three or four potentials uh, which we've already started bringing in several uh, including one from Valspar, which you can see here, we get the uh, the product and it's soapy water. And we can't put soapy water on a wooden musical instrument. We have, you know, an acoustic guitar. You know, it has a, a sound hole on it with no finish inside. And so, you know, putting water anywhere near the guitar, you start permanently staining it. So we the reason we use a petroleum distillate is one because it's quick evaporating doesn't leave any marks and uh, you know two it's effective uh, it's a highly effective degree so we, we have been working uh, diligently like, and I'll pa like I said I'll gladly pass them around this list uh, to try to find something that's low VOC the only ones that we found so far are the exact same product but exempt and in aerosol form, and it uh, aerosol is it can be a bit of a problem in, in some of the instances. My final assemblers like it, my painters don't like working with aerosols in the departments. So that's kind of where we're at. We, you know, we've we've looked at different alternatives. We're continuing to try them, but haven't been able to locate a fully compliant low VOC version. But when it comes down to it, you're, you're, uh, two things. Number one, I understand it sounds like you are working with district staff yes, as you absolutely. go through these. Okay. And the one that is promising uh, and does work is an aerosol, but half of the employees like it and the other folks that are involved in the process uh, don't like it. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Or we have not been able to give it adequate testing in the other departments yet. Okay. All right. Um, all right, those are the, that's the first question I have. I have a, a number of others, but let me uh, let some of the other board members ask uh, their questions first. Thank you. Um, Mr. Murphy, did you want to follow up on your rules-related question? Not with the rule-related question, yeah. but uh, with regard to the aerosol, uh, you don't know right now whether you could live with that or not? We know we can live with it for the final polishing of the guitar. There's really three uh, prime areas where we use naphtha or some form of it in our factory. Number one is during the paint process to degrease the layers of finish, particularly between our pore filler and our base coat. Uh, the, pore fill, you know, the pore filler is a mineral spirits based product and leaves a very strong residue that has to be degreased uh, before it can be, uh, the next coat can be applied. Uh, second is in our uh, what we call our fretting department where we apply the frets. Uh, the fretboard is made from uh, African ebony or from uh, Indian rosewood uh, and those two products are very oily and we need to degrease that product in order to uh, properly finish it. Uh, and uh, water-based, again, is it unfortunately would stain the, the wood and the, the low VOC products we have have had that effect. Um, and then finally, we have the uh, uh, our paint pro or our uh, final assembly process. The guitar is buffed with uh, highly specialized uh, buffing compounds uh, that are designed for musical instruments, and they contain a lot of fat in them. So they leave a, a pretty strong haze, and we have to remove that haze with some form of, of product. Uh, and that has been that up until that point. Uh, we have tried, uh, to answer your question specifically, the, uh, the aerosol prep uh, we've tried so far in our final assembly department. Uh, it has been successful. It works. Uh, we have also uh, tried it in the fretting department with pretty good success. We have not gone to production with it yet. We're, that's the next stage. We have not tried it in our paint shop yet. Uh, the last month and a half are the busiest period of our year. We have a large trade show that we go to and also the Christmas rush. And it's we have to be very careful about trying new products on production run guitars. 
uh, otherwise we end up receiving you know fifty sixty thousand guitar or fifty sixty thousand dollars worth of guitars back for repairs if we're not careful um, but it also doesn't address the prime issue in our in our permit which is we're not even allowed to use low VOC stuff it can only be dry or water so double whammy <laughs> but but between what you used before naphtha and I assume it's just, when you use it out of a can, you put it on some cloth and spread it over it. That's correct. And then an aerosol, which I would assume you could sp spray on the cloth and spread it, we, it over it. it. Realistically, the the uh, the exempt bottle of naphtha probably pollutes more than the small amount we put on a paper towel and go like that. So it it. To be honest, it's it's kind of frustrating for us to to go through that, uh, but we understand the regulations and we, we have to abide by that. Um, but but my question is, if you just, if you use the aerosol, it just seems like it's the same thing. Exactly. And in actuality, you 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 put it on some a cloth and spread it. Yeah, it it, it behaves exactly the same. Uh, the only hesitance we've had, like I said, in using it in the paint shop has been that uh, there are other ingredients in the aerosol, including propane and some other uh, ingredients, uh, which we're not sure how it's going to react with our finish yet. So we've just had to be, we've had to play safe to make sure that we don't damage product. Uh, our ideal, if, if we walk out of this with everything we hope, uh, our ideal would be to allow us to use uh, the the AeroPrep or a similar uh, solvent like that. Uh, but the absolute ideal for us would be to use that and in combination with the, the one product we use, the SemSolve, uh, in our paint department. Uh, and that goes to the, the total of like 20 gallons a year that we use uh, as an estimate. That that would be our ideal of what what we would like. Other board member questions? Mr. Stubblefield. Do your employ what kind of protection do your employees wear when they're applying this? Do they wear masks, respirators? Uh, all of our employees, uh, I mean, it's we're a pretty good work environment. We don't have any health and safety issues. We've never had complaints on that. We provide our employees all the, the safety gear they need. So they get uh, uh, our painters, for example, wear full-on respirators with uh, vapor masks. Uh, our final assemblers uh, have masks. Uh, some of them have chosen at points not to wear them, but I strong, I'm, I'm known as a bit of a, as a safety bad guy because I, I tell my guys all the time, you know, uh -huh. wear your mask, wear your glasses. I'm just referring to the guys that apply or gals yeah. who apply the NAPTA. Uh, yeah, absolutely. They wear appropriate safety precautions. And do you have... I didn't see anything. Maybe I should ask the district this question, whether you even need to, but do you have what we would call a bag room or some kind of filtration system to capture the vapors from the naphtha and other no, we do not. products with VOCs? Yeah, we do not. It's been so such a small amount. Our spray booth is, uh, you know, we have, we, our spray booth is where almost all our chemicals are used, and we meet the standards for that. You know, we used uh, the two-inch filters, which are appropriate, and, uh, you know, uh, all the proper precautions there, uh, everything's stored appropriately, but there's no no collection system as far as that goes. Because it's really where it's used in the shop is has always been just an open bench, you know, use it and dispose of the rag appropriately. Have you discussed with the district the possibility of perhaps being allowed to use the two that you're willing to use or even the non-compliant one if it were effectively filtered? Uh, that has, uh, we have not discussed that, but I, I am open to that discussion. Uh, but uh, it, I, I would have to f figure out how it could be, Im how it would impact the production of the guitar, but that is a discussion that we're absolutely willing to have. Thank you. Other member questions? Uh, you, uh, on, on the, have you, you've, uh, do you have a copy of the, the draft uh, order for tonight? Is there is there anything in it um, that concerns you, if, or in terms of being accurate, or the, um, in terms of the conditions that you would find difficult? 
I no, I mean it's it's pretty straightforward. Chris has been really good. She's gone over everything with me. You know, we've spoken several times over the phone, and you know, I really I've just been waiting for my day to come here and say, hey, you know, what do we do? How do how do we proceed? You know, we we want to be compliant, but we also have to run our our business at the same time. You know, and when we when we are uh, working against other states that don't have the regulations, how do we how do we come to terms with that? How do we make it work? Do, okay. The, um, we'll, we'll probably ask the district uh, similar related questions, but what, what is your understanding with regard to using the uh, South Coast exempt materials in, in our district? You, you mentioned that, that some of these products uh, have received an exemption from South Coast for use. I don't understand the question. That, as I understood it, you, you said some, some of the products that you're considering um, are, are actually allowed in, the, in South Coast Air Quality Management District? Yes, that's correct. Um, what is your understanding about why, they're not, why they would not be allowed in this district? They, as far as I know, they are allowed in this district. Uh, the, uh, what I was told by uh, VCAPCD is that they're uh, conditions mimic that of uh, South Coast, like they're used as a guideline to form the conditions here. Um, so when we've looked for compliant cleaners and degreasers, we've used South Coast guidelines to find them. So, you know, like I said, we've we've just found the the Aero Prep one as as a possible alternative. But when it comes down to it, it's the same product. It's exempt, and, I'm, and I think I'm, I haven't spoken to Chris about it yet, but I believe it'll be exempt in Ventura County as well. But, would, but it would not be exempt for preparation? Is that the issue? That's correct. It's two distinct issues. One, we're not allowed to use anything other than dry or water for preparation. And then two, even if we were allowed, it's only up to 25 VOCs. So those two distinct issues. Do you happen to know, I'll ask the district this again, do you happen to know the, uh, the applications for which it is allowed in the South Coast, these products? I didn't know because I'm not familiar with South Coast regulations. Okay. My, my guess, and I wasn't able to get a really clear answer on it as to why there is the dry or water only uh, preparation. Uh, I, we believe that it was added after the permit was first come, came up with 10 years ago. There was a gentleman by the name of uh, Tom Anderson who uh, came before the hearing board, uh, I don't know the exact date, I want to say 15 years ago, and he got an exemption. Uh, he had a rule change done, uh, and you'll notice in a lot of the rules it'll say uh, musical instrument, wooden musical instruments are exempt. Uh, and at the time, I spoke to him about it, uh, he does not remember the dry uh, or water surface preparation only. Uh, he doesn't remember that, so that looks like that has just come in from somewhere else over the years, uh, and now that puts us in violation of it. Though the though VCAPCD can probably speak more as to where that came from or why that's there. Did, is your um, how long has your operation been in in um, the the historical background indicates you've been in Southern California for quite a while. How long have you been in Ventura County? Uh, we've been in. Uh, it, We've been in business total 45 years. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad moved here in uh, 10 days before 9-11. Uh, so we've been in the same factory uh, since uh, August 2001. Okay. Um, another question on, on uh, page 5 of the draft. There are some estimates of uh, Larravee's excess ROC emissions are expected to be less than 114 pounds. Um, is that your estimate or is that the district's estimate? That was my estimate, uh, and basically because when when we first talked about it, they they came to us and said, well, "Okay, well, how much have you used? You know, how much of this product do you use?" So I went back and I started looking at the, uh, you know, looking for receipts, and that when it be, it became apparent that we don't really know how much we use because most of it I bought from a store in Oxnard called Keen's Hardware. Uh, and it's a little hardware store, and I went back and looked at the receipts, and they just use a cash register that is old-fashioned cash register. It says two ninety-nine, four ninety-nine, and so I'm going totally off of memory. My best guess is approximately twenty gallons a year. 
this, this, the number that I mean, I, I think it's it's fairly important for for the the board to understand, uh, you know, the the amount of, of emissions there are, and, and this number seems high to me based on what I've heard about getting it a pint here and a pint there, and 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 also your, what you're calculating appears to me to be the total ROC in the 20 gallons, not necessarily the total emissions. Is that the basis for your? Yes, I'm. Okay. I'm. I'm not too educated on on the differences okay. between ROC, VOC, and and this. I'm I'm going off of I buy this much, and this is how much I read on the MSDSs in it. Okay. You know, so the total that I buy is I buy twenty, you know, little cans or whatever that equal a total of twenty gallons of naphtha a year. The total emissions in that, Chris or or the other gentleman would be able to. Uh, to tell them okay. exactly. I that. think the, we'll, we'll probably ask the the, uh, the district to, to clarify that, and make it a little more accurate, Mr. Stubblefield. So, I'm confused. A, a pint maybe every a month, or a pint every other month. How does that add up to 20 gallons a year? No, Ed, I I don't know my, my exact purchase schedule. Is it because more than one person is using a pint? That's correct. You have more than one pint. Yeah, it would be me going, my dad going. It's like, oh, run to the hardware store and go grab that. You know, it's it's not, it's not something like our other paint products where it's like we we order from a specific manufacturer. We have, you know, we keep diligent records. Uh, you know, with a, we purchase the acetone. Okay, we have a special file to determine how much acetone we use or how much of this paint we use. It it was something that we honestly never never tracked. So it, the total. We, what we buy in a year is somewhere between 10 and 20 gallons a year, uh, and we buy it. I, I want to say quarts or pints. I'm sorry, I come from Canada. I'm not totally used to the imperial system. I, I it's buy cl close enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have another question. Have yes. you? This is not propri a proprietary procedure, I assume. I mean, no, no, not at all. Acoustic instruments probably absolutely it has a similar process. So, have you discussed? There's, you have competitors in Southern California, I know for a fact. Absolutely. Have you ask them what they do? Absolutely. Uh, and I have not come across a, a scale uh, manufacturer that has been willing to divulge that much. I've spoken to Tom Anderson, uh, who originally got it. I'm good friends with him. Uh, and uh, I've spoken to him about what he uses. He uses a different finish because he doesn't make acoustic guitars. He only makes electric guitars. And so he's uh, able to use other finishes. Uh, and acoustic guitars are a lot more sensitive to the specific type of finishes and the thicknesses. Um, there is a, a competitor of ours in El Cajon uh, named Taylor Guitars. Right, that's the people I was referring to. And they use a particular finish which is uh, Taylor, th they use mostly ultraviolet cured You're polyester. Taylor Guitars. Taylor Guitars, yes, right. sorry. Okay. Uh, Taylor uh, Guitars uses mostly ultraviolet cured polyester. Uh, which is, uh, it, unfortunately, we, we used that finish for years. We've recently stopped finishing, finishing using that. Mm. Um, number one, we, we had several quality problems, and it doesn't produce the desired tone that we want out of our instrument. Um, ultraviolet polyester tends to have a choking effect on the tone. It makes it a little more constrained, and so... I, I work with a... A really good musician who just bought a Taylor guitar. <laughs> okay, so I, I hope I'm not insulting too much, but it has a it has a constrained effect. We used very similar finish for you. Bob Taylor of Taylor Guitars and my dad are are good friends, but the company is so large, it's it's difficult to get in touch with their specific painter. And when they get it, when you talk to them, they don't know they don't know who you are anymore. It's not it's not the same. But they're subject to similar. Rules. They're subject Even to similar. Even South Coast, probably. Yeah. yeah. The largest one, uh, the largest uh, guitar manufacturer who in America only produces electric guitars is Fender Guitars, which is in Corona. Uh, and they have, uh, they have a multi, multi-million dollar afterburner system set up for their paint booth, which is something that, I mean, that's not something we can afford, but it's also not applicable to us because we're well below our limit. We All the finishes we use are compliant. Uh, it's just the surface prep that yeah. becomes the issue. You're too small. Your volume's too low. I hope it grows. <laughs> 
but yes, our, our volume is small. Other board member questions? Mr. Gasparino. Um, during your presentation testimony, you said acetone is used by the industry. Yes. Could you please explain one more time why you can't use acetone? I should say acetone is, is the primary cleaner for cleaning things like your spray guns, this kind of stuff, not for cleaning guitars. Uh, the standard in our industry is using naphtha or something similar, some form of petroleum distillate to clean the guitar. Um, but there are not any major acoustic manufacturers other than Taylor, and I would it would be a fair bet for me to say that they probably use something. I can't say for sure because I haven't gotten in touch with them, but I would be sure that they use some form of cleaner, not a dry prep yeah. method. Okay. Um, and also during your, your testimony, you said um, that NAPA is really, really hard to get. So my sense would be is that it behooves you to find some alternative anyway. VM and P naphtha is very difficult yeah. to get. Uh, we have roads we can get it. We have salesmen in other states that could send it to us. But other products based on naphtha are accessible, such as the the SEM solvent, mm -hmm. which this is our this thing works like a, a dream. It's it's absolutely perfect. It's quick. Doesn't leave any residue. Doesn't stain the guitar. Works great. Uh, my employees like working with it, doesn't smell, it's it's the ideal one. Um, that is readily available. Uh, I've had one supplier tell me they cannot get it, but I think they didn't really know what they were talking about. The other people that I've approached have been able to get SEMSOLVE no problem for us. Okay, it sounds to me though that you'll, you're going to be working very closely with the district to work out some kind of combination between your cleaning and your painting operations. So Yes. Okay, all right. With with the difficulty that we can't use anything because of its dry method only. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Does the district have any uh, questions for the petitioner? Uh, I don't really have any questions. I just I, I just want to clarify something. Um, I, there's no exemption in the rule that I'm aware. I don't have the rule in front of me, but I, I don't think there's an exemption for using aerosols. So if you have an aerosol that has naphtha in it, that that's going to have to meet the same limits as anything else. Uh, the uh, the cleaner that we found when we started looking uh, went to uh, you know we went to PCL. PCL is one of the big companies they supply acetone and, and everything so we went to their website and it it said right on their website this cleaner is exempt you know it's uh, I want to say uh, C S C Q I can't remember the exact acronym. it's exempt in the South Coast Air Quality Management District but it's not exempt in the Turk County okay so and, then and that's a common problem that we have. We have a lot of paint suppliers and, and people that even manufacture that are down there. Uh, South Coast has an exemption for most coating rules for up to 10 cans a day of aerosol solvents, but there is no such no such exemption in this county for that. So, so that's, so that that's a little bit of a, one. Yeah, that's a little bit of a problem. So, and we've, we've dealt with this before. As a matter of fact, we have uh, um, we had a lot of body shops that were wanting to use the aerosol cleaners and one of the paint suppliers is right across the county line right close to Thousand Oaks and it's perfectly legal there and uh, and it's been a problem we even had an, an advisory that we put out to uh, let everybody know and that's so so that so that's the problem you're gonna you know even if you get an aerosol you are going to going to have to comply with with the the, the uh, rule but that puts us back at, at square one. Right. I was, I was really hoping we had found something. <laughs> so that's uh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I, I can double check the rule to make sure, but I I, I don't recall. And there is an exemption in there. Uh, I believe Mr. Murphy brought it up for the coding of musical instruments. And I know drum drum uh, workshop and probably Anderson guitars or and, and you also you're allowed to use the higher VOC coatings. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, but uh, th there's no such exemption for the solvents, which is, which, which in your case would be a pretty minimal amount. Okay, uh, are there uh, questions from board members to the district? Yeah. 
Mr. Murphy? Yeah. Then I assume corresponding what you say when exemption uh, uh, 374.30C1 says the provisions of this rule shall not apply to aerosol coating products that uh, even though this uh, naphtha is used in their coating production, you don't consider that a coating product. No, sir. When, it, when that was written, that was for aerosol coatings and, and not for aerosol cleaners. And, and every coating rule that we have makes a distinction between uh, surface prep, equipment cleaning, and, and coating. Mr. Stubblefield? Yeah, I have a question for the district also. With regard to my question to Mr. Larave about utilizing some sort of technology to capture the vapors, uh, has the district, uh, uh, is there, I know these bag rooms, these large filtration systems can be prohibitively expensive, but can they, is there some version of one of those that's scaled down that's affordable and cost effective for a small manufacturer um, that would eliminate uh, the release of the vapors into the atmosphere? I don't know of anything offhand. I can tell you that, generally speaking, uh, even a smaller system is going to be well into six six figures, and it's they they tend to work better for a mass production system where you you know where you where you have uh, hundreds and hundreds and, or thousands of gallons that are being used. When you have uh, if you're using you know. If it's a worst case and you're using 20 gallons a year, that's a couple, two gallons a month. When you break that down, you're using, you know, four, five ounces a day um, and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to control that. Uh, it's it's uh, going to be really expensive. And generally, when you have a low concentration coming in, trying to meet any kind of a decent uh any kind of a decent destruction efficiency is 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 really difficult. If you have twenty thousand going in, it's it's pretty easy to get ninety five percent. If you have twenty going in, ninety five percent is really hard, and and that's the problem. And you know, not not to mention the fact that we have the cost. We have we've uh, we've had other manufacturing plants where they where they've had that same problem where they have a low concentration going in, and it's. It's really hard to meet a percentage, and some of the rules and regulations, some of some of some of the uh, EPA rules don't allow for a PPM limit going out. It's 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 a, it's a straight percentage. I'm not, I'm not sure how that is with the wood with the wood coatings. So it would be tough. I, I you know it would it would it it also wouldn't you know wouldn't really be cost effective. You know we do have a kind of a number they use. I think it's, I want to say $18 a pound. Uh, and, I mean, you know, this is going to, this would be thousands of dollars a pound. I mean, it would, it would really be tough. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, ask the district, the, um, the petitioner has talked about the, and, and it, it's in, it's in um, your staff report and also in, in the, uh, draft order, I believe, the possibility of getting a, a low volume or a low use exemption um, for under, at, le at least you were going to look into the feasibility of, of changing the rule for this particular, um, you know, source. Is that, is, is that the only kind of a rule change that is being considered? I'm, I'm wondering whether the, uh, the water only or dry Restrictions on the preparation are an area where the rule could be changed for this particular source. Um, I received an an email today from the engineering manager, and he indicated if the rule got changed, that he would accordingly change the permit condition. And um, as to why that permit condition got there, or 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 how it got there, it's generally based on the data that we receive from the applicant when they apply. And it may have been that whoever applied for the original permit may not have given thought to the fact that they were using NAPTA and, um, you know, maybe didn't list anything. But, uh, uh, yeah, it, it would be the, 
the the permit condition that guarantees compliance with the the rule. So if the rule gets changed, then obviously we would we would be able to change that. Now changing the the rule would be kind of a last resort, but it there is a little bit of precedence where they've actually changed the rule for the for the coatings, and I think that in a, in a case like this where we you know where we have a small where we have a, we have a small amount of people that are making musical instruments in the county we have two guitar manufacturers and and one drum manufacturer so I'm, I, I'm not sure what the effect would be of changing the rule that's something that also needs to be considered if it's if it were an industry where there were hundreds of people doing it then we probably couldn't change the rule but in a, in a case like this that would be something that the district would be, would would be able to look into anyway I I can't stand up and, and say that that would necessarily happen, but that would certainly be an option for, you know, 20 gallons a year. Would, do, you, do you think the, uh, the district would be um, able to, to refine um, Mr. Larvey's um, estimate of the amount of emissions per year that, that um, this 113.4 I mean, this, this calculation, I, it seems like he could use some help from, from your engineering staff to refine this estimate. And I, think, I think I would like to ask the district to, to see if you can turn that around fairly quickly. Get, you know, make, make, a, make clear what the assumptions are in terms of the, the quantity of naphtha-based product, and based on that, estimate the emissions. Uh, well, we will have a better idea how much they use, you know, once we've gotten into this a couple of months or, okay. or so. I mean, right now we don't really know. I would assume the 20 gallons a year is, is it's got to be a worst case scenario. As 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 far as the calculation, we 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 make the assumption that everything that was purchased is 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 going to be lost to the atmosphere. So if if they purchased 20 gallons a year and it's five point six seven pounds per gallon then we would assume that it, you know that would basically be 20 times that so 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 the district's approach to calculating emissions is that it's 100 percent of the rocs that are in the product are emitted in the case of solvent cleaning where there's where there's nothing that's being sent back to any kind of a recycler we do have recycling like if you had a gun cleaner and if, if you bought 100 gallons and sent 50 back you know Back to uh, safety clean or to one of the other companies, then you would, you'd, then that portion would not be counted. But, but basically, we we uh, have we have to assume that anything that's that's poured out of that can is is going to be emitted to the atmosphere. Everything's going to evaporate. Okay, uh, I'd like to look look at the uh, uh, the page seven of the of the draft order. Um, the increments of progress. Uh, item one talks about monitor, monitor and record the volume of naphtha and solvent used on a monthly basis. Um, may, maybe it is, is uh, you know, within this, this reporting, uh, but I would assume that that would also be the identity of the, of the materials used. And this, the volume of naphtha and solvent is pretty general. I would hope that, that in addition to getting the, vo the volume, you have a record of which products there are. If that's not built into into this increment of progress number one, I guess I'd like to see it explicitly okay, we can included. Do that. We could change that. that it that. may be that they always do that. I don't know. But well, yeah, I, uh, we need we need to specify which um, how much of each product is being used. Yeah. That would okay. be fine. Any other questions for the? Uh, yes. Actually, one one question, and the other one. The first thing is really a comment. It uh, is always bothersome. It's not my position or, or the responsibility of the hearing board um, t to deal with this, but it's very disturbing to know that you got one operation outside the county line that can get the exemption or can have. Uh, you know, it, it's the same old thing. You know, and I know I live in Cambria, and we've got industries now that are thinking about bailing because of all the requirements. Uh, and so, again, that this is above, as they used to say, my pay grade. But it just it just seems uh, kind of uh, ridiculous that we don't have a county that's working with the other counties to try to work things out. But having said that, 
My only question, and I think I had enough information from the petition tonight that makes me really want to reduce the length of this variance. I see absolutely no reason why it has to be one year. I've already heard enough this evening that lets me believe that I think within three months, maybe a maximum of six months is the period of the variance. Allowing this to go for one year is just, it's just giving the petitioner a lot of time to continue using the product. So that's my feeling. So thank you. Mr. Murphy. If the petitioner was to ask you to change the rule, how long would it take the district to get a rule change? Could that be done in three months, six months? How long? I couldn't, I don't think it could be done even in six months. There's a legal, there are a number of legal requirements for changing rules. We have to give public notice. We have to have public meetings. We have to go to the advisory committee. Generally, what you'd have, you would usually have a public workshop and then advisory committee meetings, and then it would go to the standing committee of the Air Pollution Control Board and then to the actual board itself. So that process takes a while. And would that be then a rationale for giving the one-year period of time here? Well, I think that's part of it. And then also, it's, you know, really, it's a fairly small amount of solvent, and it takes a while to contact people and to be able to try different products. So we wanted to make sure that there was an adequate amount of time where they'd be able to try everything that's available. I can remember a variance that we gave to a company that makes tops for cars where they were using a lot of different adhesives. And, you know, there was a lot of testing that they had to do with that product, and then, you know, they had to try products and then test them. And I recall that that took, I think that was longer than a year. But so, you know, we just wanted to give them the benefit of the doubt and to give them as much time as possible to test the product. And given the small amount of solvent that they would be using, we didn't feel that that was a problem. Also then, on reporting requirements, number two of the order that's on page seven said, Petitioner will monitor and record the volume of naphtha and petroleum disk dates used on a daily basis during this variance. It seems like we're using such small amounts that measuring it on a daily basis would be kind of difficult, and a monthly basis would seem to be more practical. Yeah, I think actually daily would be a problem. I don't, I'm not sure if we meant to put daily in it. Number two. I believe that the rule requires monthly record keeping, and I think that we want to be consistent with the rule. So I would change that to monthly. Mr. Stoll. So I have a question, one final question from me anyway, from the district. Is our rule different than the rule in South Coast for naphtha in terms of the emissions, the amount you're allowed to use, or whether you're allowed to use it at all? Well, our rules are set up differently than the rules in South Coast. Our coding rules, they have limits on the codings and all of the associated solvent use for cleanup and for surface prep. South Coast rules, their coding rules are just codings, and then they have a separate solvent cleaning rule. I think it's 1171. I believe that's the rule. I don't, I haven't looked at 1171 in the past few months or probably even the past year, but I know that that's the rule that has that exemption in there for up to 10 cans of aerosols per day, which is, you know, which is a huge amount to just let people use. If we were to change our rules to reflect that same exemption, we would probably have to go back and find some other place to get those to 
try to make up for those emissions. I mean, it, it, would, it would be a big amount. I have one. Yeah. Well, I, I have a request to the district also. I would like to see the district try to find and perhaps develop a low-tech, you know, reasonably inexpensive solution. It doesn't seem to me like it would be that difficult to capture this relatively small amount of emissions that are generated by the use of naphtha for this, for the part of the process that they're using it for. I mean, surely there must be something between nothing at all and really expensive, prohibitively expensive systems for large throughput for big manufacturers. I can speak to the engineering manager and see if he knows of anything. Uh, one of the uh, one of the problems that you uh, that you also have too, whenever you have a control device. It, like for painting, if you have a thermal oxidizer or anything like you know that, you you uh, generally have have to test the thing too. So so then you're talking about testing. You have to you have to source test it and make sure that it's that it's that it's going to meet a certain efficiency. Now if there's a if if there's a portable device out there that's uh, certified, you know, for for lack of a better term, uh, you know that. Personally, I wouldn't have a problem with it. I don't. the The rule doesn't doesn't really allow it, to be honest with you. And I don't know if that's, you know, if if there would be a way to write the permit so that you could use the controls rather than comply. Or well, actually, actually, it would be complying. It would it would, it would just be a different way to comply. I mean, I personally wouldn't have a problem with it, but I don't know whether the rules would would really allow that now. So you're saying NAP is illegal regardless. Even if you could clean up the toxic emissions from it, yes, is that without looking at the rule? I would just have to say that's 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 basically what I remember. I would have to look at the rule to, before I could definitely state that. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that there's that there's any exemption in there for that. And generally, what uh, uh, happens is when they when they write these rules, this is a wood products coating rule, and this is for you know cabinets and and everything you know for people doing for guy for guys that have furniture refinishing shops you know every kind of thing that you can imagine so it's so it's kind of a catch-all and it's and it's it's not always everything to every person and there's you know there is a public process where we where we have where we have people come and but you know there's there's almost always something after 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 every brand new rule gets adopted, where where somebody looks at it and they say, oh, it doesn't really talk about this, or it 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 talks about this, and it's not possible to you know to be able to use those products for this for this kind of thing. And I think that's why the coding portion of that rule was was changed, you know, uh, because I think after the fact they found out that that you know it's it's not you know it's it's um, it. Uh, would would have basically would have it would have put some people out of business, and I don't I don't you know, and I don't think that that was what the intent was. So it's 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 uh, tough, you know, because we all we always seem to find these things after the rule's been adopted, even though we do the outreach and you know we there there are there are, there are a number of meetings that we have in uh, house uh, basically where we where we sit and talk about the rule, but I've never made a guitar. And you know, I've, I've I've been to a lot of cabinet shops, and I've been to a lot of places where they do finishing. And as as it happens, there's 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 always somebody that that comes after the fact and says, "Well, what about this? This is the way we do business." And the uh, person that actually wrote the rule never thought of that, and, and didn't have guitars in mind when he when he wrote the rule. You know, so so it's a problem. It isn't you know, it isn't really perfect. Mr. Casperino. Yes, I think uh, if I can interject. Uh, I, I think I heard enough about the operation to guess that the return on investment to try to put in any kind of a control technology is going to be extremely cost prohibitive because we're talking about people that are taking small instruments and doing onesies and twosies on benches is what I heard. So um, you can't capture that. Uh, typically when you're going to have spraying or solvents, you've got air flows, you've got water curtains, you've got... Uh, there, there, there's a lot of technology involved, and, and so I think it's going to be, I think the response is going to be that it's going to be very cost prohibitive to try to put control technology. Um, but I think the answer is still, still working 
going after those MSDSs and trying to work with um, the, the district staff as quickly as you can because, uh, you know, uh, I, I'd hate to see you uh, have to shut down just because you can't find anything unless we can get the rules changed. So thank you. One of the uh, – if I, may I have to speak for a minute? Um, one of the, the things in our permit that uh, we had a stumbling block with immediately is that in the actual uh, permit, it lists the amount of uh, chemicals that we can use and the amount that uh, we can have. Uh, and in the permit, it actually states that we are allowed to have naphtha uh, or a petroleum distillate with under 750 grams per liter of uh, VOC. So we can actually have it. We just can't use it based on the dry method. And then this secondary rule that says we can't have the uh, anything other than 25 milligrams. So we have three different contradictions in the in the permit. First one being, you know, well you can have it. Two, you can't use it. Three, well you can, but it's only 25 milliliters per or 25 grams per liter. So we have these conflicting statements in our permit. Thank you, uh, Mr. Murphy. Yeah. Uh, it it sounds like this would be a difficult thing to get the rule changed, but in the C, uh, you know, 7430C exemptions, Section 4, it says the limits in subsection B1 and B2 for pigment coatings, fillers, wash coats, sealers, clear tops shall not apply to the coating of wooden mu mu musical instruments. So already... You're saying a large portion of the coatings, et cetera, doesn't apply in this one little narrow industry. It would seem uh, that if this isn't uh, that you could just add uh, B5 to that also because we're really, I mean, the district is dealing with a de minimis amount here. I'd like to... Uh State what I, I think my uh, <clears throat> understanding of the timeline is the way I interpreted um, the the draft order and, and the petition is that the the rule change if if one is requested would be in series with this variance rather than to go along parallel. If the district can confirm that or if council can comment on that, uh, so this is the, my my understanding is that the rule change. Um, would not be occurring within 12 months. That the, the petitioner has the 12 months to, to either come up with a solution or to request a rule change, and upon that request, then the district will respond. Uh, is, is there anything going on in parallel that I'm that either is not written in here or that that I'm not understanding? Well, we're we're hoping that they can find a solvent. That's 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 the first option. And then, if it turns out that they're that they're not able to after several months to find the solvent, then we could we could look at a rule change. So I guess it's conceivable that we may be back in front of this this board uh, after this one expires if it's granted, asking for more time while we're waiting for the rule change. I'd like to point out both to the district and to the petitioner is that I don't think this board would be uh, very sympathetic if if that happens. That We'd le really like to, to see you, as Mr. Gasparino suggested, work this in a period of as, as few months as you can. And if you request a rule change, there's nothing that says you have to wait 12 months to request the rule change and to say that you can't solve the problem. As I, as I read this, maybe I'm wrong if council has an opinion on that. But um, just to for, for nothing to happen but but for you to say that you can't find a solution uh, in 12 months would be a not I don't think we see very well either on the part, on the part of you or the part of the district I'd like to see some, some things happening one yeah. comment I'd make is under the health and safety code section the one year maximum can be extended if there are increment of progress included so if you inc include definite timelines when things have to be done by like completion of all uh, sample solvents or whatever and reporting back requirements and that any needed rule changes is, is uh, the process is started for that within so many months 
then you can go longer than one year. But currently, with the red quest before you, you've got a one-year limit. Our, in, uh, our intention, uh, as of right today, uh, yeah, we need a variance to continue, uh, but our intention is to ask for a rule change. We will continue to try to use, find and use low VOC solutions where possible. We have a track record of that, uh, and the VCAPCD recognizes that, and our intention is to ask for a rule change, as uh, Mr. Murphy suggested, to include B5 in the you know, is exempt for musical instrument or for uh, wooden musical instrument makers. Uh, that that is our primary intention is to ask for that uh, rule change. But as I've been informed, you know, as I was told by uh, Chris Cote, that uh, in order to request a rule change, you first have to get a variance so that you can continue operation while you request that rule change. This is a comment and. Uh, also a question, but my comment to the petitioner would be, you know, I don't know how many guitars you're making right now, but of course you're a businessman. You want to make more if the market will bear it. So we could find ourselves back here, even if you were successful in getting a rule change, because it probably would still have a threshold beyond which you could not emit uh, BOCs from uh, whatever you, you and the district agree that you can use. Um, so um, it would probably make more sense to try to find, you know, some alternatives that will work rather than simply, you know, that rule might work right now, but if you double your production, it might not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the best case scenario would be that the uh, petroleum distillates fall under the limits which are within our permit. Uh, if that's the case, our business can virtually quadruple in size before we would be anywhere near the limit that we would need. The, the, quantity, the quantity that is shown is such a small amount in, in our mind, and not just in our mind, but also in v, VCAPCD's mind. I mean, they, they've repeatedly said we're talking a very small amount. So quadrupling that is still a m m pretty minor effect, uh, as I understand it, it's still a pretty minor effect on the environment uh, when you look at the grand scheme of things. So, w you know, would we be coming back if we asked for, okay, give us an exemption for, for 20 gallons a year, would we be coming back if our business doubled? Absolutely. Uh, if it falls under the general limits within our permit, uh, and it just becomes B5 as part of uh, the rest of it, no, we wouldn't be coming back. Yeah, it's just a little comment. Um, you, you had me, and I certainly supported uh, everything you said, but the moment you said that your intent is really to ask for a change in uh, the uh, um, conditions uh, versus really trying to find a substitute, uh, that didn't set too well with me. Um, so I really think it behooves you as a petitioner to work uh, expeditiously and do due diligence to try to find something and certainly work with staff so that when it does come back to us, we know you've exhausted all of your research and you know, potentials of trying to find alternatives so that we can give you the kind of answer you want when the, when the district comes uh, before us with uh, changes in the rule. Okay. I, absolutely. I, I, I don't want to indicate to you that we're not looking. And, and the VCAPC will also comment on it. We are diligently looking. The reality is, is I don't want to come before you a year from now asking for another variance. As a, not only as a business person, but as a, as a, as a, a human being, I want to make sure to be doing the right thing. You know, I could, you know, there are finishes that I could be using that are 10 times better than the polyurethane I use. 10 times better, sound better, they're old. I don't use them because they have a stronger environmental impact. You know, my company, I, I work really hard to make sure that uh, everything possible in the company is has a positive effect on the environment. 
you know, we, we buy forest certified, uh, FSC council certified wood. We use low VOC finishes. We, you know, recycle everything we possibly can. We get absolute maximum yield out of all of our wood, uh, for basically so that we don't waste. We have an environmentally conscious business in that regard. So when I come before you and I say our intention is to apply for a rule change, the intention is not to just go on to continue business as usual. We absolutely fully intend to exhaust every method possible before us. Uh, and we've already ordered 10, 15 different cleaners to try. We've gone through, I mean, I must have had my, my core painter, the one painter I have, spend you know, two weeks solid so far behind a computer and on the phone trying to find appropriate methods. Uh, the, there is a, a hard burden for it in this uh, economy. We're, we're doing everything we can. So it's, it's not for lack of want. It's so that I don't need to come before you again asking for the exact same thing. It's, you know, we're going to work towards that. Whether or not we get the variance or a rule change, we're going to continue to try to find low VOC alternatives. Thank you for the feedback. Appreciate it. If there are no more questions or comments from the board, I'd like to ask if there are any members of the public who would like to address the, the board on this matter. Seeing none, uh, I'm going to, going to close the, the hearing uh, for the board deliberations and, and comments. Do board members have any, any comments on this? I'm, I'm comfortable with the... Uh reporting requirements, the increments of progress, and this I think this is a good solution for now. I think we need to give the petitioner time to air out all these different uh, options, try them out, see how they work, and then get back to us. So I have no problem. I'm comfortable with it. If, if that's a motion, then I will second that's that. That's a motion. <laughs> <laughs> Do we, uh, with the one change of the daily to monthly? The daily to monthly, correct. Well, yeah, yes, right. So, so let's, let, can, we, uh, can we have that motion again for the record, Mr. Zobelfield? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I move that the uh, a board approve um, uh, this uh, variance order uh, with the one change uh, with respect to uh, monthly instead of daily uh, in the increments of progress. In the reporting, excuse me, in the reporting requirements, in uh, number one, yeah. So we have a motion. Is there a second? I will. I will number second. Two. Num number two. Two. Number in number two of the reporting requirements. Sorry. If there are no other comments, I'd like to ask the clerk to uh, call the roll. Board Member Murphy. Uh, uh, aye. Board Member Gasparino. Aye. Board Member Stubblefield. Yes. Board member Herlock. Yes. Well, your petition is, is granted, and uh, we, hope, we hope we don't see you back here. It, likewise. <laughs> uh, and the, uh, the hearing is closed. Uh, I would like to, you know, outside of the hearing, um, make a comment on, on a very minor um, aspect of the title. Um, of this draft order, because the, the real order is going to be the same. I've, I've never seen hearing board of the Air Pollution Control District, comma, County of Ventura. I think really the, the district is independent of the county. It's a separate entity, and, and I think it's always been referred to as the Ventura County Air Pollution Control District. I'm talking about page, the, the first page of the, of the draft order. Um, if, if that's been on all the other orders, I've missed it completely, but I don't think that's what this the Ventura County Air Pollution Control District is called. Yeah, very, very minor, but uh, let's get it right. I haven't heard from anybody lately, so I think this is it for a while, but I'll let you know when I hear from something. Thank you all.